Hello, welcome back to Team 4 on Nursing 585 Radio 1, available on d2l.ucalgary.ca. Our podcast is brought to you by Alex Frame, Asher Patel, Ilham Rasaminajad Bonpay, Sahil Daman, and Sion Lee. And I'm your host, Hala. On today's podcast, we will be talking about a nursing dilemma, pain management in clients with a history of opioid abuse. This dilemma was brought to our attention by Asher Patel, a student on Unit 64 at Foothills Medical Center. Throughout today's podcast, you'll be hearing from all of our contributors, um, and they'll come on one after another. Hello, Asher. Hi, Hala. Thanks for having us. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the dilemma that my group faced um, on Unit 64 at the Orthopedic Surgery Unit. So on this unit, pain is largely controlled through opioids. uh, And we've constantly been involved in situations where uh, opioid medication was withheld as a result of misconceptions, judgments, and fear towards clients with a history of substance abuse and clients who were labeled as drug-seeking. Okay, and I understand you guys have brought in a case study for us today. Frank is a 42-year-old patient admitted to the orthopedic unit for post-operative arthroplasty. He is an otherwise healthy male with the exception of a history of opioid abuse. He was captured on a Canada-wide warrant, and during his arrest, he got in an altercation with police, resulting in significant trauma to his left knee. He continues to complain about unmanageable post-operative knee pain. You are the student nurse called into the room to address the patient's concerns. Let us watch the reenactment on the next slide. Nurse! Nurse! What happened? It still hurts. Is it hurting again? It's still the same. I gave you pain medication one hour ago. Didn't do anything. How would you rate your pain out of 10? 12 out of 10. Really? Oh, you don't have any pain medication to do right now. Call a doctor, do something. Okay, let me talk to my private nurse. Esher, I need your help. Sure, Sion. What's the problem? The patient in room two, uh-huh. he was looking for pain medication. Okay, when was the last time you gave pain medication? I gave Percocet one hour ago. Okay, and what's his pain level now? He says 12 out of 10. 12 out of 10? Yes. There's no reason why his pain level should be that high. Um, I heard in report that he's a drug addict mm-hmm. and uh, he has like a history of drug seeking. Um, just. Just tell him that there's no more medication due right now. Okay. The situation you just saw represents an ethical dilemma we're likely to see during clinical, either as registered nurses or while we're still student nurses. How did this situation make you feel? And what would you have done differently, either as the student nurse or as the primary nurse? Pain is defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. According to Alberta Health Services, opioid abuse is characterized by compulsive opioid-seeking behavior and often includes changes in the brain that are characterized by the patient's inability to maintain control. According to World Health Organization, the international classification of disease identifies six features, strong desire to sense of compulsion to take opioids, difficulties in controlling opioid use, a physiological withdrawal state, tolerance, progressive neglect of alternation, alternative pleasure or interest because of opioid use and persisting with opioid use despite clear evidence of overly harmful consequences. A Canadian study found that 37% of opioid-dependent patients admitted to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto reported receiving opioids solely from physician prescriptions, compared to 26% of patients who receive opioids from both a prescription and district and 21% from district. So there are several participants and stakeholders present, the patients as their pain is undertreated, the nurses as it's their responsibility to assess and administer the medication, 
the physicians, as they are the prescribers, the governing bodies, as they regulate, set guidelines, and hold people accountable, and the media, as they report on the opioid crisis. So where does the dilemma originate? That's an interesting question. If we look back, Canada and the U.S. have had the highest opioid consumption in the world. Back in the 1980s, authors like Porter and Jick attribute quality health care to good pain management. And this reduced the fear of addiction and created a sense of safety with opioids use. In the 1990s, the American Pain Society recognized pain as our fifth vital sign and raised the attention among policymakers, researchers, and patients to acknowledge the significance of pain management. So opioids are more commonly prescribed as an important treatment for chronic non-cancer pain. Well, pharmaceuticals took advantage of this and encouraged the use of opioids for the safe and effective management of chronic pain. Today, pain is not, is not being treated as a multidisciplinary approach, and therefore we've, we've lost some of the checks and balances for overprescribing, which can result in abuse and addiction. This overprescribing made opioids readily available in medicine cabinets across the country, providing easy access to youth, family members, and individuals that do not require opioids to manage pain. So the recent opioid crisis is now a public health concern. So this made me think about what some of the social factors are that might be contributing to the dilemma Asher and the other students brought forward. Um, so when we think about individuals who use opioid, who abuse opioids, um, they're actually a vulnerable population that make up a large number of hospital admissions. These patients require more complex care, frequent hospital admissions, and they usually have various comor comorbidities. There's typically also some exposure to adverse childhood events, and these can include things like violence, crime, sex trade, um, or intergenerational trauma. Their pain is typically undertreated, and this can be due to multiple reasons. Um, a few of them are infrequent or inappropriate assessment, under-administration of PRN meds, inadequate education in nursing school or medical school to physicians and nurses on pain management, particularly with this population, time constraints, and concerns about opioid adverse effects such as respiratory depression, over-sedation, tolerance, and uh, relapses in addiction or serving in addiction. Now, when we look at our stakeholders, healthcare providers um, or physicians, part of the uh, social factors that contribute to how they deal with this dilemma is a fear of causing an overdose. They also don't want to be involved in serving the addiction of um, individuals in this population. There can also sometimes be the inappropriate application of a tough love approach. Um, so just trying to under-prescribe under opioid pain medications um, and use other analgesics to manage pain. So when we think about some of the assumptions that nurses can bring to the table, um, there's sometimes the assumption that patients can control their addiction. And there's this perception that addiction is a choice, and therefore it's a behavior that should be punished. Uh, nurses can sometimes label patients as drug-seeking when they ask for pain medications too often. And they can consider the management of this population difficult. Now, there's one study who looked at um, the relationship between nurses and individuals with a history of opioid abuse. And what they found was that nurses found there wasn't much of a reciprocal caring between the two. The nurses didn't find that they were being thanked or that there was a lot of positive language being used with them when interacting with this group and um, were not really open to the nurses. Um, and that sort of affected the relationship in the way that they would label them as difficult. Uh, with nurses, there can also be a lack of education and role support for working with this population. Now, a study regarding opioid administration by nursing students showed that patients who had a history of addiction did not receive opioids because nursing students believed that they overreported their pain intensity or that they did not state sufficient pain relief with medication and request for more opioid analgesics. If we look at our other stakeholders, the media, the media attention to the opioid crisis and opioid abuse promote the idea that addiction is a crime, and this can influence the public's perception, physicians' perceptions, and nurses' 
perceptions of drug users as bad. There are some political factors that contribute to the dilemma. Pain BC supports evidence-informed practice for doctors and adequate pain relief for patients. It encourages non-pharmacological approaches to pain management and also support efforts to curb the unsafe prescribing of medications. Pain BC has serious concerns about the implementation of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of British Columbia and Surgeons' new prescription standards, which warns physicians against prescribing opioid to high-risk populations. Pain BC suggests that new policies will force chronic pain patients to take desperate measures in their search for adequate pain relief. So what are some of the financial factors associated with chronic opioid use? Poorly managed acute post of pain in patients with chronic opioid use have extended hospital stays, increased care costs, and delayed mobilization and ambulation. Preoperative chronic opioid therapy has a risk factors for 90-day wound complications, pain diagnoses, emergency room visits, readmissions, and continued use postoperatively. An estimate by Jane said that about $571 per year is spent on postoperative long-term use of medication. In another study by Jane, uh, looking at cervical fusions, she noticed that chronic opioid users undergo have a cost of additional cost of uh, medications, emergency room visits, constipation, injections, and a range of uh, complications with the fusion between $623 to $27,000. There are those who advocate pain treatment without opioids, as pain assessment and treatment is a complex interaction dependent on attitudes and beliefs, education and training, and professional experience in caring for other patients with substance abuse history. Oftentimes, healthcare professionals view pain solely as something related to a disease pathology and therefore assume that opioids will be effective to treat that pain. However, pain that is stomaticized, for example, pain from psychological factors such as depression, are not opioid responsive. Therefore, staff's attempts to treat and manage this pain um, can result in opioid toxicity. It has also been shown that long-term opioid administration eventually reaches a dose ceiling attributable to the rapid onset of analgesic tolerance, coupled with the slow development of tolerance to untoward the effects of respiratory depression, nausea, <laughs> and decreased gastrointestinal motility. One study showed that addiction is chronic disease of brain involving cycles of relapse and remission. Administration of opioid facilitates relapse by activating reward pathway in brain and delays remission. Addicts would misuse their opioid due to too much temptation, and they would, be, would not be able to help themselves as they have a really low threshold of getting addicted again. Other researchers identified that addiction is simply a set of bad choices, and opioid administration enforces the bad choices and the rewarding effects of opioid. Healthcare providers did not want to be seen as they fitting a bad habit. Another research demonstrated that patients with opioid abuse disorder will likely require higher doses of opioid than non-opioid dependent patients. If these patients have a renal or hepatic impairment, when opioids are aggressively dosed to them, it causes higher risks of depressed mental health, decreased respiratory rate or test wall rise, and meiotic pupils. In contrast, there are also several parties that advocate for treating this population with opioids. There are several reasons for this. The first being that analgesic tolerance affects analgesic requirement. So opioid tolerance, as we know, is the state of adaptation in which exposure to a drug induces changes that result in a diminution of one or more of the drug's effects over time. So as a result, these patients require higher doses of opioids than non-opioid dependent patients to achieve the same analgesic effect. Another reason is that we want to prevent consequences of undertreated pain. These consequences include neural changes that can lead to chronic pain, anxiety, depression, isolation, poor health outcomes, and mistrust of the medical, 
of the medical system, as well as poor wound healing, respiratory infection, sleep disturbances, impaired mobility, DVTs, and an increase in length of stay. Another reason to treat with opioids is that appropriate pain management for patients in acute care settings may serve to minimize preventable morbidity and mortality associated with the risk of self-managing pain via illicit drug use. A qualitative study conducted in Vancouver showed that in an effort to conceal in-hospital drug use from healthcare providers for fear of being involuntarily discharged, illicit drug users have resorted to injectable alone drugs in locked washrooms or injecting with syringe of unknown origin. Findings suggest that patients may resort to the self-management of pain while using above-mentioned injectable drugs. Effective pain management may contribute to reduction in rates of leaving hospitals against medical advice as well, which in turn may considerably de- decrease healthcare costs attributed to readmission and lengthier hospital stays with more severe health complications. Now we're going to talk about the position taken by different bodies. The International Association for the Study of Pain, by releasing the Declaration of Montreal, has recognized access to pain management as a fundamental human right and emphasizes that it is the right of all people to have access to pain management without discrimination, the right of people in pain to acknowledgement of their pain, and the right of all people with pain to have access to appropriate assessment and treatment of the pain by adequately trained healthcare professionals. International Nurses Society on Addiction hold the position that Patients with substance use disorders and pain have the right to be treated with dignity, respect, and the same quality of pain assessment and management as all other patients. Nurses are well positioned and obligated to advocate for pain management across all treatment settings for patients at various points along a continuum of substance abuse. Position taken by BC College of Physicians. Physicians may be hesitant to prescribe pain medication to opioid-dependent patients for fear of being disciplined by their professional regulatory bodies. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of British Columbia have warned physicians against prescribing opioid to high-risk populations, including patients with the lifelong disease of addiction and those with major psychiatric illness or personality disorders. Moreover, The American Pain Society and the American Academy of Pain Medicine's clinical guidelines caution that the potential risk of opioid therapy may outweigh the benefits associated with drug misuse, abuse, and addiction for some patients with a history of substance use. So our position is that the assessment and management of pain is a human right. And as future nurses, it is our obligation to ensure this right is met. At the same time, we need to monitor and prevent substance abuse. So to accomplish both of these goals, we have a number of strategies. One strategy is to develop a trusting and therapeutic relationship. Remind the patient that you're willing to listen, problem solve, and move forward. Accept the patient's self-reported pain and refrain from making accusations or assumptions towards the patient's actions. It is important to be firm and inform the patient that misusing the opioid may result in discontinuation. However, remind them that pain control will continue with other medication. The term of misuse should be clearly explained to the patient, such as cheeking medication, attainment, and self-administration of opioids. Another strategy includes providing good teaching. This includes educating the patient on the implications of high opioid use. Another one is to actually assess the patient's pain-related beliefs. There's often what patients experience is what's called a fear avoidance model. This is where patients fear movement due to the pain. And this essentially causes them to develop a pain disability, where there's an exaggerated negative psychological response to the anticipation of pain. To prevent this, early education preoperatively about pain related to this belief may encourage a more adaptive response to post-operative pain and reduce the dependency on opioids. We as healthcare providers can also empower patients to become pain independent. 
as by as setting goals for gradual reduction and elimina elimination of opioid intake prior to surgery. This will serve to A. Set boundaries, B. Involve the patient in the decision making process, and C. Empower previously opioid dependent patients to take control of their health. Chronic opioid users have altered stress response systems and could benefit from addiction specialists for cognitive behavioral therapy. Patients with psychiatric comorbidities develop pathological use of opioids to cope with stressors. So as a nurse, you could offer and recommend addiction specialist consultations. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. That's all the time we have for today. I hope we were able to provide some insight into how to manage this common nursing dilemma. Thank you to our sponsors, Metoprolol. Tune in next time for a controversial discussion on medical marijuana with our special guest, Snoop Lion.